Okay, so thank you everyone for being here. You have a lot of merit because this is the last talk before the, the lunch. So double thank you <laughs> for you. Uh, also thank you to the organizers that has put a lot of effort in, in this event. Um, uh, yeah. Let's start. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> emotional because it's my first event in person after two years. Um, let's start uh, telling just three things about me. I have been an Android engineer for more than, I don't remember, 12, 12 years or something like that, or more, I don't know, because the last two years has been <laughs> pretty strange. Uh, I have been using Android for a lot, um, uh, well, enjoying all the changes that has been happening in the ecosystem. I'm also Spanish. Uh, I live in the Canary Islands. I promise I didn't bring the Kalima. Uh, I don't know what it was here, but <laughs> I, it, it was myself. And also I have to confess that I am hobby addicted. So I have a lot of hobbies. I have two children <laughs> and try to uh, have time for reading, sewing, drawing, and also the music. And the music uh, has been, oh, Oh, I can hear me more now. Uh, the music has been always uh, something very important in my life, but uh, until mm, like two years ago, uh, I haven't attempted to play an instrument. So I went to the school, to the music school to enroll my daughter, and I ended up being enrolled myself. So I started learning how to play the violoncello, which is my favorite instrument. Uh, I have my classes like three children of 12 years old and myself, but it's pretty fun. And one of the first things you have to learn when you are learning uh, how to play an instrument or music uh, theory is how to recognize an interval. And this is an interval. This is the, uh, sorry, I don't know why it, it changes the sound when I, maybe it's my, it's when I turn my head. So uh, an interval is the gap that can exist between two nodes. So for example, here we have the C major scale, which is the scale that we all uh, learn in the school. And one, uh, for example, one fifth interval, uh, you can find it between the C and G node. Um, and as part of you know, music theory, you have to learn to recognize them by ear. So if someone is playing a piano and reproduce this interval, you have to say, ah, that's a fifth. But it's very difficult because as I said, I have a lot of hobbies, a little time, a very bad memory that is uh, getting worse with the years. So uh, there is a trick, which is to learn some popular musical references. Uh, to remember how does uh, uh, an interval sounds. In that case, for example, we can say that a fifth sounds uh, like the beginning of the Simpsons song, like something like ta 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 ta. So the interval, the fifth interval, will be the ta ta. And this is a trick that musicians use to learn about them and to memorize. So now I had more problems. I had to memorize all those intervals. Um, and I asked to myself what an Android developer does when he or she has a problem. We do an app. So I decided to create an app to help me to learn those intervals. Uh, it will be a quiz app where you uh, can hear an interval and then you have to choose which one of the options given it is. And then at the end of the quiz, you will have a, a summary with all the uh, failed intervals, and you could see a, uh, you you will have a link to a video in YouTube that uh, uh, has the interval reference. So it will be easier to remember them. I also decided to use Flow because uh, I wanted it to be, to use a reactive uh, architecture like MBI. Um, and also uh, because it, it is a um, very promising API uh, from Kotlin. I have also used RxJava and implemented uh, this MBI architecture with RxJava. 
So I take this chance to, to use a flow instead. So let's compose this symphony today. I'm very sorry if there is any musician here because this is kind of a aberration, but <laughs> we are going to see what MBI is, uh, what is unidirectional data flow that we will see that is a concept that is very related with MBI. We will see what uh, the API of flow can uh, give us. And also we are going to say what is state flow and we are going to compose this MBI architecture. So let's start with uh, MBI. MBI uh, is something very natural. We were talking in, like in the two, two talks before about algorithms that are based in natural, in the nature. And MBI is, could be one of them because it's based in an interaction, in a conversation that uh, a person is having with a computer, a phone, whatever. And w when we do this kind of conversation, we usually have an interface that allows us to uh, speak to the phone. Uh, in our case, uh, we are uh, selecting buttons or whatever uh, there is in the UI, and then we are getting some kind of uh, uh, modification to the UI in the, in the phone. We can say that we are giving some input to the computer and the computer uh, as, uh, is returning so, some kind of an output. And this looks pretty similar to something that we as developers uh, are used to see day by day, which is a tra function. So what Andrex Stoll says, which is uh, like the grandfather of this uh, architecture was that everything could be modeled like a function. So he created this cycle GS, which is uh, a framework for JavaScript. Um, and the main theory uh, behind this was, was that, that everything could be modeled as a, as a simple function. So in our case, we are going to have the intents that are the actions the users are going to do. These actions are going to modify the model and then we will have a new model to display in the view. And this view, uh, new view will generate more intents. So the conversation between the, uh, the phone and the human will continue. And this is how it looks in our graphic. We have the intention and the model that will be modified by the user and, and the view. But in Android, it looks like something like that. Uh, we, we are going to have that intent, which is intention. If, if there is a, an Android developer here, okay, so maybe the intent word is not very <laughs> um, good for the Android world because we already have something called intent in this case. Uh, it means a user intention. Then we have an interpreter that will translate those intents in actions, which is like the domain representation of uh, the thing we are doing. Then we have the processor that will do all the dirty uh, work. Uh, he's going, the one that is going to connect to databases, network, etc. All the side effects will be there. And then we have res the result that will be the result of the, the, of the pro processing thing that has just happened. And this result will be uh, received by the reducer, which will be responsible to generate a new state. We are going to see this uh, in detail now, so no worries if it sounds strange. Well, as I say, I don't like the word intent, if you are working with Android, it's very confusing. So I like to change it to UI event. So let's start with, uh, with the beginning. So in my case, I had a, an app that is a quiz. So when I'm going to model this MBI architecture, I, I'm going to think what the user can do. So in my case, uh, he or she can start uh, the quiz, can select an answer, uh, can see the result once the quiz has finished and can navigate to a sample and then he or she can uh, press the button to finish. So this is what we are going to use, all the UI event uh, that you need from your, 
to make your UI work. And then as actions, um, you will uh, model all the things the, the app will do. For example, get the first question, select an answer, see the result, navigate to sample, finish. It looks pretty similar uh, to the UI events we have. So in my case, this is the interpreter I had. So it was just a UI event map to the action. Uh, that, that, that's the same thing. So I decided to, to, to not have it, just to be a bit pragmatic. But there could be uh, occasions where you have to use it because uh, for example, you, you can take advantage uh, the, to, of the interpreter to map the different UI events to the same actions. For example, if, if you have a list and you have an UI event to, uh, uh, to make the first load of the list, and then you have another uh, UI event to, to load the next page when you reach the bottom of the list, you can map them to the same action. So this is when the interpreter uh, comes handy. Then we have the processor. The processor will just uh, do the, as I said, the magic, the, the dirty work. The <laughs> he is going to go to the, um, to the database, to the uh, network, do whatever it needs to do to, modif to modify that model. Um, I have seen several ways to do this. You can connect here to your domain layer. So uh, you call from here your uh, use cases or you can connect it directly to your repositories or whatever um, works for you and for your team. And then we have the reducer or the view state part. So this processor is going to produce a result. For example, if I'm asking it, uh, if I'm sending it the, the action of uh, obtaining next question, we are going to have a result with the next question. That could be a low adding, a failure, a CSX result, or whatever state we need there. And then we are going to have a view state. The view state is just a model that uh, will define my, my view. Uh, there are two uh, ways to do it. One of them is having just a class to store all, all the information. So you will have all the parameters you need to, to render in the screen uh, your view. And there is another one which is to use uh, different classes for different states. And which one do I have to use? Well, it depends, as always. If uh, you can have more than one view state at the same time, for example, if you show an error while showing the question, then you will need to use a, a data class because otherwise you will lose the information if you receive another state. Um, if your state are mutually exclusive, then you can use a SQL class. For example, if after an error we are not supposed to show the, the, another kind of the view, part of the view, uh, then it's ideal to use a SQL class. And this is my reducer. So I'm going to receive an update, a result, um, and then I'm going to do a copy of the last view state and modify just the parameter I want to modify. For example, if I have a que the question here in the next question Sussex, I am uh, setting the loading false because it, it could be true if, if, if it is still loading, set the role to null and set the information of the question. Uh, 
I have seen cases where the reducer tends to grow a lot because uh, every minor change you have to do to the UI is going to be through the reducer. So one advice uh, I can give you here is that if, if it grows uh, so much, you can split it in several reducers. Uh, yes, for example, giving them uh, a responsibility, for example, one for the question, one for the results, etc. And it will keep your code more, more clean. Okay, so this is what MBI is. Let's go to the unidirectional data flow. And unidirectional data flow is a concept that is really easy uh, to see here because uh, everything goes, uh, the data apart from the user, and it goes uh, to the same, using the same direction and the same pipe. And I always like to refer it as it, it was a pipe. So the user does actions and whatever, and then uh, those events or actions uh, go through the whole um, flow, and the response uh, arrives to the user. And everything always follows this. But how can we assure this behavior now? Yeah, here it is where Flow comes in handy. Flow is an API from Kotlin. It's a call string. I mean, it's a pipe where you can emit uh, elements. Um, it, it has a structured concurrency, has efficient data transformation, and it's really easy to test. You just have to uh, list, um, send something uh, through the flow and then collect it and see if it is the expected uh, result. Flow is always um, composed by an emitter and a collector. And th this looks pretty similar to this. So for us, it's ideal. How can we use Flow? Well, we have some utilities from the API. We have Flow builders that, that allow us to create those flows. We have Flow operators, and we have Flow collectors that, that allow us to receive uh, all those emissions. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as Flow builders, the most famous and popular ones uh, they are really, really easy, as all the DSLs that uh, Kotlin has. Uh, well, you just can create a flow uh, with the uh, suspendable block that you include in the Lambda. You can define flow of uh, from a fixed set of values. You can convert any uh, collection and sequence into a flow. Also, you have flow operators, which are, are pretty similar to the collection ones, like line map, filter, take, this, this thing until change. Also, you have flattening flow operators. If you have used, for example, Ares Java before, apart from collections, the, those will be very familiar to you. This allows you to uh, flat the mission and continue emitting them as it was from the same source. And you have flow collectors uh, that will allow you to collect the information at the end of the pipe. You have collect, reduce, that uh, will take uh, the last value and allow you to do something with it. Uh, you will have also fold and first that we only collect the first one. And how can we do this? How can we translate all this code that we have been seeing before uh, with Flow? Well, it, it's something as easy as this. We will need something that will emit the UI event, we will see. Then we will map it to an axiom. This is our interpreter. This is the part I didn't use, but uh, if you need it, uh, you have to use. Then we map that uh, axiom to, um, to, uh, to a result using the processor. And finally, we are going to collect and reduce uh, 
that new result. But we have a problem. The problem is that flows are, co are cold. And that means that um, if we connect something here, if we don't connect something here, uh, we cannot collect those flows. Also, we need a way to, uh, from the UI, to, to emit those UI events. So we are going to need another piece, another core, <laughs> which is the state flow. And the state flow uh, is a read-only state with a single of the devolved data that emits updates to, to the value to its collector. It's a hot flow because its, its active instance exists independently of the presence of the collectors. So right, it's exactly what we need. So in the case of the view state, we can have a state flow that will emit all our view state changes. This will be listened from the UI here in the repeat of life cycle um, method. And then we are going to render view uh, every time we have a new state. Um, one advantage that has using a state flow here is that a state flow is conflated. And that means that uh, it has already um, integrated the distinct until changed uh, operator. So if you receive more than one emission containing the same uh, state view, you are not going to emit all of them to the UI. You just are going to emit the different ones. And this is good because you are not going to be rendering the same and the same and the same uh, view again. You, just going, you are uh, just going to render when the view really changes, which is great. Because rendering is one of the most costly things in the, in the Android world. But for the actions, for the UI events that the user is going to send us, we are going to use another um, class, which is share flow or mutable share flow and in this case, that doesn't have the conflated property. And why do, why do we do that? Because we don't want to miss a user interaction. So if the user does the same interaction, we want to process all of them. Um, and this is why we use share flow. So we had this before, and now we can change it and do this. We will have the action flow where we are going to receive all the actions of the user. We are going to do all the process, and then in this reduce B state, we are going to publish using the share flow um, to, the, to the UI. And is it finished? No, that's all we have at. In this case, is the infamous single event, is when you need to do something in the UI uh, temporarily. So if, for example, you want to uh, show a toast message, you don't want this toast message to uh, be in the next view state that is going to be sent to the app. So there are some approach to solve this. I haven't found the ideal one. All of them has, a, has some pros and, and some, some cons. There is the option to use a different flow just for, for posting these single events. And this uh, different flow is, is, uh, is only is going to, to send this event and, and it's not going to send it again. But I don't like really much this approach because it breaks a bit, little bit the, thing, uh, the unidirectional data flow uh, concept. But then there is the option to use the same flow. So uh, it will mean that as soon as you show the single event in the screen, you are going to send a new event that is not going to be a user U event. It's going to be a UI event that you are going to, to send. Um, the problem that has, uh, this option has is that you have to do all the uh, flow, all the unidirectional data flow to, to make this work. And it will get very verbose if you have a few of them. And then there is uh, the option to send double view state events. 
So uh, once you send one view state saying show the toast, right away send another view state saying uh, you don't have to show the toast. But yes, there are no an ideal solution anti that I have seen so far. And now we have done it. Here you have uh, some not musical references in this case that told more st extensively about this architecture and the use of uh, share flow and state flow. And that's it. Chimpun in Espanol, because it, it doesn't exist in English. Thank you. If you have any question, you can...